um, every album just kept building and building, you know, and moving on, continued to build. Yeah. Um, Sweet Love was incredible. Um, but also, I tell people, one of my personal favorite Commodore songs, and arguably one of the funkiest, not a lot of people know, especially if they're not really diehard Commodore's fans, is Give Me My Mule. Oh, my God. Oh, my God, dude. Look here, man. You've been, <laughs> you have, <laughs> you've looked into the archives there. <laughs> <laughs> Oh that, yeah, that was overlooked. That track is overlooked. Oh my god, that track is so funky, dude. Oh my lord, that, like, yeah, um, like um, shaky ground, kind of funky. That's right. Yeah, exactly right. In, in fact, speaking of shaky ground, um, Jeffrey Bourne um, took the guitar lick from "I Feel Sanctified" and built. The track for shake us uh, us uh, uh, shaky grounds, mm. and uh, <laughs> so it, that's 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 why it sounds like a lot like it because <laughs> the guitar lick from Sanctified is in that song. Interesting. Yeah. How'd you get so funky on that track? You mean my mule? Oh my god! Well. You know what? It is <coughs> back to what I was saying. You know, doing those those we weren't twilling our thumbs when we didn't go into Motown to record those albums. You know, to record our first album those those two years, we were in the shed. We went and we um, we would perform the four of us: uh, Ronald Lepred, Walter Orange, and Marlon Williams as the Mark Four on campuses, you know, um, Tuskegee, you know, Auburn, you know, University, um, just to stay sharp. And we would uh, literally um, try to be as funky as we could possibly be and doing things on orthodox stuff, you know, like Motown bass, uh, uh, Jameson, who played on a lot of the bass, you know, he played the bass on a lot of those tracks. Now his style was really good. I mean, for what it, for what they were doing, you know, with the running basses, lines, and stuff like this. And and uh, my thing was, <clears throat> let's simplify everything. And if we can have the kick and the bass doing things together that's simple, the impact will be greater. And with that snare, you know, and then just, and let me just put some funk around that on the guitar. And then of course, using the keys more of a, in a funky manner too, versus just layering it and just, you know, letting it be like, uh, you know, you know, uh, more, more of a, of a um, uh, how should I say, more of a pulsating type, you know, approach. And, you and know? snap in the beat, yeah. Yes, yes. And so, the, but it all started with simplifying the bass and, and the kick and making sure those two are very simple, but just tight and, you know, and of course, um, uh, being staccato uh, a lot with the licks versus just a bunch of notes, you know, all over the place. That particular track, I think, maybe was so funky that they didn't even put it out as a single or promote it. It was like, <laughs> you know what I mean? It was like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I got to tell you something else, Thomas, about that record that you may find uh, funny. Sabu, the instrumental. Oh man! Back, I was in um, junior high, eighth grade, and we made a film. Uh, this really long film called "The One Million Dollar Nap." It was a spoof mm -hmm. of "The Six Million Dollar Man," and the soundtrack for our movie uh, was two songs. Was that one? And wow. no, uh, and um, "Always There" by Ronnie Laws. Oh man! And That's so uh, 
you know, I hope you're not going to hit me up for royalties now. But. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, you know, i tell you what. I um, When we went to the Philippines and we broke the, the Beatles attendance record there, um, we took a break and um, while we were there, and we went to this island, Cebu. And man, it was such a great getaway, you know, um, very um, undeveloped in some parts of it, where the people were still like, um, maybe it seemed as if anyway, they were like maybe 50 years behind time or whatever, you know. Um, but what was so amazing was when we went up into this one village where they lived literally in the tree houses and stuff, and um, they didn't have clothing and they didn't have, some of them didn't have food or whatever, but they had a boom box and they had the Commodore's machine gun album. Mm -hmm. And our, our manager, Ben Ashburn and I, you know, we were so touched. We said, wow, man, you know, here are these people um, apparently took their last monies to buy our music. And so I said, you know, I've got to write a song and, um, uh, you know, just in tribute to them. So Sabu was uh, birthed out of that trip. Wow. Well, the yeah. song, you know, it had kind of an espionage spy kind of thing going to it. So it worked yeah. well for like a movie. It does. <laughs> Very cool. So the next record, uh, well, actually, uh, so Sweet Love was your first crossover hit. Um, right. how, how did it feel? Taxes score like a top 10 pop hit. Well, what was really good about it was um, when I look back at those days before we started recording and we were doing songs by Crosby, Steele, Nash & Young, you know, in particular, we thought, man, wouldn't it be neat to have like a song where we can do some great harmonies that um would you know remind audiences of maybe of that era, you know, Crosby Steel National or Beast Boys or something, you know, fresh, you know. And to dream about doing that and then actually doing it and seeing the results where people accept it and really buy into it and not only uh you know uh African American fans but to cross over to, that was like a dream come true. You know, it's like, man, we really, it actually happened. It is really, um, um, it's almost like being on a football team and the coach draw up this play. And he says, now, if you execute this, you know, we should be in good shape. That was, that was one of those. It was like, man, you know, this, I mean, because, you know, what are the chances of in the music business? I mean, you got a Z records out there that's being, you know, uh, promoted and uh, radio stations and not, but so many stations. But then you got all these acts and all these labels and, you know. Oh, yeah. so, Million to one at least. Yeah, you know what I mean? <laughs> well, so that was really, that was, that was major for us. That was like, okay, we can do this. It was fortunate for for you guys and fortunate for fans too that you were given enough creative license to be able to put the variety of music you put on the records and also to be able to stretch out and do something as long and developed as like a sweet love, you know? Yeah, yes. In fact, um, um, I, I perform that now, even now with my kids, you know, when we were touring and um, it's amazing. We were just in um, in Indonesia and and um, at the Java Festival, and man, to see the fans literally sing every lyric and you know wave and just uh, you know, it's a timeless song. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. 
Okay, so uh, Hot on the Tracks came next in 76, and that one had another one of my very favorite tracks. And based on Slippery When Wet and Give Me My Mule, which track on this one do you think that I fell in love with? Oh, man, that's a good question. Okay. Hmm. Um, let me think and see what was on that album. Um, well, it's one of the hits. Yeah, okay. <laughs> 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 just to be close no no that was the next album no um, well i'm talking i'm talking the funky track on this one. Oh, the funky okay um hmm <laughs> scott you fancy dancer man okay man what am I <laughs> right man right 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 <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, yes, yes. Yeah. Oh man. Oh so, man, that song. Oh my god. Yeah, if you notice now, we're uh uh, uh like you say, everything is building, right? Mm -hmm. Uh we're trying to build in our sound as well and in our creativity, you know. Um now fancy dancer is is like a a a a sneak preview to the tones that we're going to use in easy, you know, uh, but it, 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 you know, we kind of, we, 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 we're um, introducing it in a funky way. And of course, um, with that, just that the pulsating of the bass line and, you know, uh, and of course, Lionel now is really, feeling his oats by this time now he's you know he's riding that horse and it's like he's in that saddle and it's like you know with swagger you know yeah <laughs> i remember seeing you guys do it on tv too back then. yeah 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 <laughs> yeah yep. yeah i mean you guys are all on the the guitar and bass are hitting it at the same time on that track, right? Oh, no question. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Um, but also the title track was great. Um, no, not the title track, I'm sorry. High on Sunshine. High on Sunshine, oh my God, yeah. Love that one, yeah. Oh man, yes, thank you. Yeah, we, uh, uh, we wanted to, um, do something that was melodic, but at the same time a sing along. And uh, and and how can we? Because obviously, you know, you, with Stevie Wonder and you know on the label and and some of the um, other artists, you know that, that obviously that you would you know um, tune into. Uh, we we did not want the Commodores to be just known as just a band that you know has um, uh, songs that are just um, maybe one or two chords and you know or just uh, one lick that goes through the whole song or whatever. So it was like, okay, how can we um, kind of diffuse that notion that we uh, you know you know just that because we never wanted to repeat. A particular uh, sound or a particular uh, uh, um, vein, you know. We wanted to keep growing and keep moving and keep building the expectations. And it's like, oh man, oh wow, you mean they can do this too? So it was, you know, that kind of a, uh, approach to it strategically. Then now musically, how can we do that? And um, stay still, you know, where you can pat your foot to it and, but sing along and, but at the same time, musically take them to a place where they haven't gone yet. Mm -hmm. And so, um, that was, uh, Lionel and I's, uh, assignment on that one. And, and, uh, but at the same time, um, giving a message, a feel good message. That's another one that personally I think should have crossed over more and been just more of a universal hit kind of song. 
Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. Um, and, you know, I didn't really mention it before, Thomas, but your rhythm playing, I mean, it was so key to it also and, and very unique. Um, you just gave the song so much color and weren't always just sort of locked in the kind of, you know, chunk of chunk kind of rhythms that so many players were. You know, you gave it a lot of color and flavor. How did, you know, does that go back to the ukulele days or what? Yeah, Scott, you know it, you know it. <laughs> in fact, uh, I was, uh, um, it's funny. Um, I don't know, man, and, and you you probably have instances like this too, things that, that's naturally uh, easy for you uh, may look to be complicated for others, but as I um, try to, even to this day, I, I, you know, I'm always constantly trying to color things a little differently. And um, when you can sort of um, um, blend in different styles in one piece, then I, I think you, you stand a chance of, of impacting people in a way um, that's not offensive, but intriguing. and and, and to draw them in, you know. And so, um, you know, I, my thing is, you, if you can take one note, it's the same note that everybody else is playing, but how can you take that one note and present it in a different way? You know, uh, or how can you take this one chord and present it in a different way? And, or how can you, use break the rules a little bit you know and say even though everybody else this chord change precedes this chord ah, flip it you know or you know do something different to it or you know and and so um it's that's the kind of thinking that i i try to approach you know the rhythms and um and like like we talked about earlier, trying to put it on a different trajectory so that it, it's not you, it's familiar, but it's not. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. It feels comfortable, but it's different. Yes, that's that's it. That's a better way of explaining it. Right, right, right. Um, so you mentioned it, but of course that album had the biggest hit on that record was just to be close to you, which to me kind of was the first of a certain style of Commodore's ballad. Yes. I sort of continued. Yes, yes. In fact, um, um, now, James Carmichael, um, I have to give him his props on this record. He was just in another zone um, when it came to those um, synthesizers and all of the, the various um melodies of uh and setting up that whole flavor and that feel for that you know um and that's him playing most of those uh synth parts mm -hmm. you know with the hunting ooh, you know ooh, ooh. and it's more it's like a um uh, a vocal being sang on the keys mm -hmm. and and as um and as Lionel would uh, weave in between those it just gave it uh such a, a unique um um feel and um but the thing that was so uh, educational for me on that song was the time and the, and the intensity that James Carmichael took on each of those lines. I mean, like one, one, one of those lines might have taken two days because it was like, ah, uh, it's just, you know, and what I learned from him was so priceless on that was that um, your 
to really get your emotions out on on in, in, instrumentally to the point where even if it didn't have any lyrics if it's supposed to really touch that part of your soul and in your heart and and you you, <coughs> you keep doing a take until you get that one and and if you you know just the notes is not good enough it, it has to it has to penetrate to the soul and uh that track if you just play that track without any lyrics or anything you know you, you should be feel the same energy you know what i mean or the same uh, um, um emotions that track you know had such a sort of stark quality to it that I didn't think it could be as big of a hit as it as it was because of that, but people picked up on it and they did, and it yeah. became a big hit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, now, of course, the next record was where you guys blew up to the moon. Um, the Blue Record or the Commodores Record in '77. I'll never forget that. I was just starting high school, and um, I mean, you guys just ruled the airwaves with that record and. Uh, had Brick House, of course, and um, all the songs are great, but the hits, uh, Easy and uh, Zoom, great track. Yes. Um, they're all great, but those three in particular were the ones that really got the airplay. Yes, uh, sir. Did, you, did you guys have any inkling that you were going to, like, hit it, you know, with all eight cylinders to such magnitude with that record? Well, you know, to be honest with you, we were really feeling our oats, if you will. I mean, we, we were, the swagger was there. Um, we, but at the same time, we managed to keep our feet on the ground and we still had um, the, wherewithal to to use our um, uh, little group that we would use to 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 get a consensus of what to put on the album you know um, and we would we you know would still go back to Tuskegee and staying grounded I think was the thing that was very very crucial for us because even though we had had the success, you know, with Sweet Love and and Just to Be Close and all of this, and now we are headlining uh, and you know and touring now, um, we we're being we're we're formidable and formidable in the in the in in, in the um, live concert, uh, and 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 in fact, acts are now saying, "Wow, ah, uh, well, we don't know." If we want to follow these guys, we you know, if anything, we'll go on first and let them come on after us. So the fan base was like just, and we were seeing now a crossover audiences in our in our live shows, which was like, wow, okay. Well, it's one thing to have a crossover song being played on radio, but it's another thing to have the fans actually come to see you live. And so we knew that we had to step up our game to the next level and that it was going to be, um, if we could do this, that it would be a home run because now, you know, Motown was all sold now on us as being, you know, um, the act that could not only take the label, uh, but just we got to get behind these guys. And um, <clears throat> so, but at the same time, now you're starting to get a little, 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 little things is happening internally that causes you to be like, oh man, well, you know, even though we got all of this going, 
we got to be careful uh, because we don't want to destroy any of the stuff that has gotten us to this point with egos and or with, you know, so, um, and then you have a manager who is, uh, you know, is feeling his oats too, because, you know, the cigars and everything, hey man, you know, <laughs> I told you guys, you know, we, we, we were going to do this. We could do this. So, and then you got uh, uh, lawyers now. Everybody's got different lawyers, or, you know, different, uh, you know, managers, uh, business managers, or whatever. Much and more so, complicated. Yeah, it's getting a little complicated here, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, uh, how do you now... Make sure in the midst of all of this that yeah. you don't lose the record. Mm -hmm. And so um, sometimes it's good to go revert back when you got stuff like that going on. And then, of course, that's what we did. We went into, we had closed sessions. Because now, you know, we got to try to keep out the outside noise, you know. <laughs> But when I look back at all of that, <clears throat> all of that played a part in this record being so great. Um, why in the world would anybody put chains on me? I paid my dues to make it. Everybody wants me to be what they want me to be. I'm not happy when I try to fake it. Those lyrics would not never come, you know, had it not been for circumstances, mm -hmm. you know, like meetings and everybody trying to de put demands on you here and there, you know, uh, and all you want to do is make music. <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> so when you can use all of those circumstances that are around you to galvanize, um, the creativity and the, uh, and and if you can channel it in a way where it's like okay you know what this got to be the biggest smash that we put together period um, and scrutinizing it from that perspective and kicking out stuff that ah uh, it was okay but that's yeah it's not gonna make the record man I'm sorry um, in fact. Brick House was the last song. Everybody was kind of like, whew, this album has taken much longer than we thought. And, you know, gosh, I can't wait to get out of here, get back to Tuskegee, or get back to where we're supposed to be, blah, blah, blah. Well, at least you didn't have to think of a title for the record, though. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's exactly right. <laughs> Well, I mean, you took a risk too, in a little bit, because Easy had a country flavor to it, but right. it got over, you know. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And 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 see, these are the things that we were strategic about, um, and that is okay. We've crossed over in the pot. Now, what else can we do? Let's infiltrate the country market. So, you know. That was intentional. Um, T timing plays a role too, though. I think you know, in, in all this. Um, at the time, you know, I mean, I couldn't figure out really why Brickhouse crossed over so much, but yet Fancy Dancer, Slippery When Wet, and those cuts didn't. You know, it was just like the right time because, really, that track is just as funky as those other ones. That's and, true. Um, that's true. You know, That's before true. it crossed over to pop, it was just another great Commodore's funk song. That is so true. That is so true. Timing, <laughs> you're right. Timing is everything, you know, um, because um, if you notice now what else is going on in the industry at that time, you know, uh, there's a transitional that's happening where disco is about to try to, you know, become um, uh, 
a, 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 in a place where everybody was like, uh, what's what's this? What's this disco stuff? You know, and if in our next record, in the midst of disco, we put out three times a lady, <laughs> a waltz. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, natural high record. Natural high record. Before you talk about that, though, I got to tell you, that was right around the time when I got to see you guys perform at UCLA Poly Pavilion. Okay. I don't know if you you did so many shows. I don't know if you remember it, but it was. Oh yes. It was a thrill for me. So. I remember that show. I remember that show, man. <laughs> yeah. yeah. In, in fact, uh, um. Man, you're flashing me back now. That's right. I remember that. <laughs> so your show at that time was very similar to the live record that came out. I'm sorry? I said your show at that time was very similar to the live album you guys put out right around that time, too. That's exactly right. That's exactly <laughs> right. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And, uh, in fact, uh, when I was at Ray Parker's uh, yesterday, he was talking about that. He said, man... All I all I remember seeing is like all of these people, and you know, um, he's always been a fan of my live performance. You, you know, he says, and, and you were doing all these antics on the guitar. And it's like, man, look at this guy. <laughs> you know? uh, but um, you guys were high energy, man. Oh man, we were high energy, dog. High energy. Yeah. And, in fact. Uh, um, I'm blessed now to perform in these songs with my kids. And so the energy from them uh, has given me that new birth of energy. And, and my, my show now, too, is still very high energy. It's, it's, it's amazingly high energy. But when I looked at some of the photos from back then, and how, um, you know, the expression on some of the fans' faces, you know, um, and to think that, wow, you know, here are these fans are in all what we're doing, and all we're doing is what, what we've been doing, you know, for all these years, but because now we have a record, it, it gives them a reason now to to come out because they've heard, you know, on the radio or whatever. And uh, but uh, all I had to was, oh, well, we're still at Tuskegee, just you know, the little Tuskegee band that's uh, happened to be out here in LA. You know, <laughs> it, it must be challenging though. They, <clears throat> excuse me, it must be challenging to try to stay grounded though through all of that though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. Excuse me. <clears throat> You're talking about a lot of influences, Thomas. Um, you know, going back to Hendrix and Sly Stone and Crosby, Stills and Nash and all these different things. At this time, you guys had elevated to where you were one of the biggest bands there were. You know, and you were certainly matched. You know, on the R and B side, you know, Earth, Wind and Fire, um, and, and bands like that, uh, Isley Brothers of that time. Did you guys pay much attention to what those other groups that were kind of your peers were doing, or did you try to kind of, you know, keep tunnel vision as far as that was concerned? That's a great question. We 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 uh, we we knew what they were doing from a standpoint of, you know, uh, if you took it from a business perspective and say, you know, okay. It, know what your competitors are doing. But from a standpoint of they're doing this, so we better do this, no. It was like, we know what they're doing, but we're going to do this. <laughs> you know, in fact, we, uh, it's a funny story. Um, our, let me see, our third album, the promote, uh, the, the concert promoters, it put us with Earth, Wind, and Fire in um, Kansas City. 
And uh, so we said, back then, you had groups that were, man, it was crazy. Groups would, I don't know if they still do this today, but back then, some of the groups would get in this big tug of war about who's going to go on first and who's going to, you know, go on second and who's going to headline and who's going to. So I, uh, our attitude was, we don't care. We're, we'll go on first. You know, we don't care. We just want to go on and because when we go on, we're going to do what we're going to do. And that's it. You know what I mean? The audience will, you know, either like us or not going to like us. So anyway, we went on first at at the um, in Kansas City. And I'll never forget Maurice um, came out because they had never seen us. Came out and they saw the crowd and how we had gotten the crowd. Because <laughs> we were, our whole thing was interacting with the audience. And their thing was the musicianship of playing and, you know, not necessarily reacting, interacting with the audience, but. We're from it, like a jazz mentality for Earth, Wind, and Fire. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And so when Maurice came out and saw the crowd, hey, we had we had the crowd in our hands and they were going crazy and they were trying to grab us from, the, and, you know, and they was like throwing stuff up with their underwear and stuff up on the stage. And he, he said, who are these guys? We don't ever want to be on the show with them again. <laughs> but uh, that was the joke that, you know, Maurice, you know, God bless him. He was a great guy. He would always, um, you know, we became friends after that, but it was like, and then I remember um, playing with other acts, you know, like, um, um, oh man, um, in the early days, Cool in the Gang was in New York where we didn't, you know, neither one of us had hit records. And so, um, it was the Battle of the Bands. <laughs> and so Robert Cool and I are really good friends. Robert Bell and I are really good friends. We talk about this, you know, he said, man, y'all used to kick our butts all the time on those on those Battle of the Band things. <laughs> I said, yeah, Robert, but there was another group called Willie and the Magnificence that used to kick our butt, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so it was good competition and, um, to answer your question, yeah, you do learn from others, even if it's not something, you know, if you learn what not to do, you know what I mean? That's, and that's you know, I think such a key ingredient that helped keep you and other bands um, that have similar um, success, particularly with a, a loyal following, is to be true to yourself and not chase trends and what others are doing. That's it, man. That's it. That's it. Because, you know, unfortunately, uh, you have acts that, uh, you know, they only get one, one, one hit and not that they are not trying to get others, you know? And so, but they chase that sound and they, and the audience, you know, they go, okay, well, we heard that sound on the last record. Can you give us something else? But, because they got a hit on that particular sound, they keep chasing it. They keep chasing it, you know. Well, to be fair, a lot of times the labels push them also. That's true. Yeah. Uh, got, that's true. Um, so, Tom's so next record, Natural High, had the Three Times a Lady, which you already mentioned, was another smash hit that was sort of in the just to be uh, close mold, if you will. Right, right. Right. Um, wasn't really another huge hit off that record, though. No, it wasn't. Uh, Long High was um, was a, was a single on that record, uh, but again, you know, it didn't have the success of the other records. Midnight Magic in '79. Um, you had two big hits on that one. Still, which continues that ballad. Yeah, yep. And uh, Sail On, 
which is kind of like a successor to Easy. Yes, it was. You know? It was. Yeah. yeah. Uh, because, you know, we we tapped, we revisited the, the country market with an R&B flavor, you know, um, and the harmonies, of course. Um, we kind of wanted to link the sweet love harmonies and that kind of a thing with the sail on, you know, um, to just um, reconnect our audiences from that song. And, um, but at the same time, not duplicating, you know, the, 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 the actual, uh, okay, we got to make another sweet love. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, they're, they're distinctive songs, but you can't, but the flavor is, is there the threads. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and I think that record, uh, Midnight Magic, you had some strings in that one, didn't you? Yes, we did. Yeah, so that was kind of a new element, wasn't it? It was. And if you remember, uh, the disco era at that time now was big. And so we, our thing was, our thinking was, well, we we don't want to totally just ignore it. And um, maybe, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll put this song out, uh, The Midnight Magic, uh, with the strings and... Um, just to at least identify with what was going on at the time. 